my nature not I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut today we'll go bird watching tomorrow we'll catch toads the next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut well I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut hello and now perhaps we should discuss the concept of the true bugs you know the word bug is not simply a synonym for the word insect no it refers specifically to the hemipteroid insects the insect orders heteroptera and homoptera and they're included suborders the gymnocerata and cryptocerata for the heteroptera don't you just find that a little bit confusing when biologists take a perfectly normal word like bug and they tell you that only they know the real meaning of it and that everyone else is using it incorrectly. That bug can only refer to one thing. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, bug is a useful word. It has many meanings. We use bug to refer to any sort of insect or related arthropods, spiders, mites, centipedes, scorpions, and so on. They're all bugs in the broad sense. Some people use the word bug to refer to bacteria. I got a bug and I was sick for a week. That's okay with me. I beg to differ. The correct term is microbial infection and microbiologists are also subject to the rules of correct nomenclature. Now the unfortunate thing is that when we are referring to the insects that entomologists call true bugs, there's no other word for them. I wish there was another word. I mean, there are long, complicated words, but we need a nice, simple word, like gwed or quup or something like that. Oh, we look for quups. Of course, we'll never, uh, we'll never reach that point, so we better just live with the term true bug and spend today's episode exploring the world of true bugs. It's a huge subject, and we are just gonna live with the fact that we have to call them true bugs, no matter how much it truly bugs us to do that. We know of only 60,000 species of true bugs compared to about a million insects in general. Okay, well, before we go any further, let us examine a typical true bug. Now there's a peculiar odor in the air here. This is stink bug country. This birch tree is loaded with stink bugs and stink bugs are a particular sort of true bug. There are many, many species of stink bugs. Let me show you some stink bugs. Well, uh, we'll start here with an adult stink bug and you can see that it has a nice broad shouldered look and a big triangular plate in the middle of the back. That's a uh, characteristic stink bug feature. And uh, this one happens to be an adult female, and she is guarding her newly hatched babies. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? I mean, whether it's dinosaurs or stink bugs, as soon as you find out that they look after their babies, they seem so much more appealing. Now, the mother doesn't look after the babies for long. Eventually, they're out on their own. There's another batch of babies up in here, and you can see that they are red and black in color, and that is a warning color that lets birds know that they smell bad and they taste bad, and if they all hang around in a group like that, the red and black effect is even more pronounced, and it's more obvious to the uh, predators that they shouldn't go snacking on these little critters. And if we pick up, I won't take one of these mother ones, I'll just take this guy here. If we pick up a stink bug, and hold it to our nose, it stinks. It's a weird smell, it's not particularly distasteful, and it's unlike anything that uh, I can think of, but it's certainly not something you'd like to eat. I wish I could share it with you, but we haven't invented the telly-smelly yet. Stink bugs. 
Hmm. And I should point out as well that there are other things that are called stink bugs, things like some darkling beetles that put their abdomens up in the, in the air and give off a little puff of smell. Those are not true stink bugs, those are beetles. So these are not only true bugs, they are stink bugs, and they are true stink bugs on top of that. Hello, my friends. You know, it is often said and rarely demonstrated that the mouth parts of the insect are very much like the feeding utensils of the human being. No, I am not trying to sell you a set of knives here. <laughs> no, I am going to instead demonstrate to you the mouth part configuration of the common horsefly as an example of an insect with an interesting mouth part configuration. Picture, if you will, the mouth parts consisting of piercing styli, one set mandibular and one set maxillary. These are the piercing structures which create, as we say, the wound. The horsefly flies down onto its intended prey, the horse, and plunges the styli into its fleshy blue surface, creating a wound from which fluid freely flows. At this point, the spongy lower lip of the horsefly is brought into play and sops up the fluid, which is then ingested through the tubular esophagus. Mm -mm, good horse fluids are thereby consumed, and this is an approximation of the mouth part configuration of a horse fly. Consider at this point how this differs from the typical mouth part configuration of a true bug. True bugs are characterized in a very precise way by the so-called sucking mouth part. One set of styli are replaced by the sucking tube. The styli fuse together to form the tube, which is actually not simply one tube, but two tubes. There is an inner tube, so to speak. Ha, 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 ha through which saliva flows. Saliva flows down this small tube, and the mixed food and saliva, now partly digested, flows up the large tube. There is a second pair of styli, but they too are different in configuration. They are much longer, much thinner, much more, what shall we say, elegant. And the entire thing, instead of having a spongy lower lip, no, it has a sheath-like lower lip into which the mouth parts fit. There we go, snug and secure. Now, this sophisticated arrangement is plunged into the intended feeding surface. The sheath-like lower lip bends elegantly out of the way. The styli and feeding tube extend into the feeding substrate. At which point, the Siberial sucking pump begins to pump the fluid into the stomach of the true bug. Mmm, tasty and no mess, beautiful. This is the sophisticated arrangement which characterizes, oh, bit of a salivary blow out there, which characterizes the true bugs, the hemipteroid insect orders possessed in this fashion by no other insects. Butterflies, moths, and some lice also have sucking mouth parts, but of a different sort. Let's do a little aphid watching here. Now, there's usually not a lot happening when you watch aphids, but if you're interested in true bugs, you gotta spend at least a little time watching aphids. Watching them do what they do best, which is to sit on plants and suck the juices out of the plants. That's aphids for you. That's why gardeners hate aphids. That's why farmers hate aphids. But if you're gonna be interested in true bugs, you have to spend at least a little bit of time looking at aphids, different kinds of aphids. Here's some pale green aphids. They're just uh, sitting there. If you look over on the poplar tree, you can see some kind of black aphids and they are being tended by ants in the classic aphid ant fashion. The uh, ants stroke them with the antennae, the aphids produce honeydew, and the ants uh, 
eat the honeydew and protect the aphids from aphid predators. Lovely. But what else can you say about aphids? Well, they do have an incredibly weird life history, a life cycle. Picture, if you will, a cold winter day. All the aphids are eggs. Some of those eggs are out exposed to the elements. Others are being looked after by ants in the anthill. The eggs hatch into baby girl aphids, all female. And in the case of the ones that are looked after by the ants, the ants take them and put them on the plant. They start sucking the plant juices. They grow up to be aphid women. They give birth, live birth, no eggs. They give live birth to more females. And those ones grow up and they give live birth to more females. No males involved. They have never seen a male. And then those ones, by the way, all those uh, three generations, no wings. Then, mysteriously, those females give birth to more females, some of which have wings. These ones will fly to new plants and give birth to both males and females. Isn't that amazing? The males and females fly around, they meet each other, they mate, they lay eggs, and the whole thing starts again. Very peculiar, but they are true bugs. You might wonder what's so true about aphids. The true part is that they do have sucking mouth parts and a baby aphid looks an awful lot like an adult aphid as you can see here just by all the various sizes. That means they have incomplete metamorphosis, no pupil stage in the life history. But doesn't that just irritate you? They are true bugs as if they did something right, but they have incomplete metamorphosis as if they forgot something. You just can't win with these entomological terms, now can you? Okay, this looks like a good spot. Okay, well let me show you how to ping leaf hoppers. All you do is you find yourself some lawn, any old lawn will do, and then you run your fingers through it. Whoop, there they start to go. This is harkening back to one of my earliest entomological memories, by the way. I used to do this all the time when I was but the wee child. Now leaf hoppers, oh, let's get one in view here. There's one right there. They are true bugs, and they're fairly closely related to aphids, but they have much sleeker wings. The wings press closer to the body, and they have nice little color patterns, many of them. Many of them are just green or brown, but others are mottled. Some of them are brightly colored. Uh, some of them are multicolored. In fact, if you start looking at them carefully, you'll find that there are lots and lots and lots of different species of leafhoppers. If you wanted to learn them all, it would be about as difficult as learning all the birds in any particular area. So it's a big thing. These leafhoppers are not to be taken lightly, but they're kind of neat. And they're, of course, they hop. You poke at them with your finger, whooping, and there they go. And they hop. That's what they do. That's why they're called leafhoppers. They hop from leaf to leaf, sucking the juices out of the leaf. And let's see, it's okay. There's a big one right up here. You don't want to spook them. But if you look at it carefully, you see how the face on that little guy is, well, a friend of mine says they look like whales. Now, isn't that weird? The face on a leafhopper looks like the face of a blue whale. But on a whale, the streaked throat is where the huge plates of baleen are for straining things out of seawater. On the leafhopper, that striped throat is, uh, is where the pump, the Siberial pump is, that pumps the plant juices out of the plant and up through the sucking mouth part and into the little leafhopper tummy. So, Nature's a wicky wacky thing, and that leafhopper looks like a whale. Bizarre. Anyway, leafhopper pinging. It's uh, it's fun. Woo! Ping ping. I hope you give it a try. But remember, if you get into it, you'll never want to mow the lawn again. You'll just feel too guilty. It's my excuse. <laughs> Leafhoppers can cause damage to some crops, so the study of leafhoppers is an important part of entomology. Now let us review the fact that there are two distinct sorts of insects which are referred to correctly as true bugs, the homopterous and the heteropterous insects, the difference being in the wings. Let me diagram for you here a typical homopteran insect wing. 
The wing is all of one general sort with a few veins in it. Put a thorax in there. Another very like wing. There we go, and a couple of hind wings. An abdomen. A head with eyes. Little antennae. Oh, how nice. It is something like an aphid. Now, these are called homopterous insects. Homo, meaning same, and ptera, meaning wing. On the other hand, picture, if you will, a wing which is, at the base, very thick, where it attaches to the body, and a flimsier, more membranous, more typically wing-like tip. If you had two of those wings, and I will diagram them here, folded over the top of the insect's body, they'll give it a scutellum, a pronotum, a couple of eyes, a head, antennae, front leg. Ooh, it's looking very realistic. Could walk right off the blackboard. <laughs> there we have a more typical heteropterous insect. Hetero meaning different, because the wing is of two different sorts, and patera meaning wing, or sometimes you will see the alternative term hemiptera used, hemi meaning half, and patera meaning wing, because half the wing is of one kind and half is of the other, but there you have it, the two typical sorts of true bugs, the homoptera and the heteroptera or hemiptera, both true bugs and both proud of their wing configuration. The biggest homopteran bugs are giant tropical cicadas the size of a canary. Two bugs are like to love a hue, or so the poets wrote. Comparing them seems awfully queer, some kind of wacky joke. But bugs can love, and love they do in similar ways to me and you. But is their buggy love really true? Oh, why are they called true bugs? Oh, why are they called true bugs? Kissing bugs, dead bugs, assassin bugs. Hemiptera homopterus They live and die like you and us And often I do wonder why True love is like Hemiptera Aha, you say? I see! Oh shucks! Both love and bugs doth often suck So why? you're saying you're saying John we're glad that you showed us the true bugs because after all it's the last major group of insects that uh, we were waiting to see on the nature nut series but they're not doing very much they're just sucking the juices on plants okay the stink bug was looking after its babies but so what they're not as exciting as other insects well you see this foamy mess on the plant stem here it looks like a bit of, uh, you know, shall we say, spittle. Well, sure enough, that is 
the home of a spittle bug, which is another kind of true bug, and that creature is relying on the principle that if you want to prevent something from being eaten, the best way to do that is to expectorate upon it. And to a bird, this is a very unappetizing looking uh, thing. But here's what birds don't know. Birds don't know that if you take a little grass blade and you poke into the foam, you can entice the larva of the spittle bug to come out. There, you see, it's a cute little thing. It's got nice little dark eyes and a pale green body. And it's living a very peaceful, fearless life in there. It doesn't have to worry about running out of food, doesn't have to worry about drying out, doesn't have to worry about birds. Uh, it's not spit, by the way. What they're doing, they're sucking the juices from the plant, the sap, they're digesting it partly, and then from their, shall we say, hind end, they are blowing bubbles and living within the bubbles, even living within each other's bubbles. That is a spittle bug. Young true bugs all look much like the adults, but they do not have wings. So the next time you're out walking with a friend and you see an interesting beetle or grasshopper, your friend says, hey, what kind of bug is that? I want you to resist the temptation to remind them that the word bug has a specific meaning in entomology. Instead, I want you to enjoy whatever it is you find. Go ahead, call it a bug, but if you do find a true bug, hey, enjoy that too. After all, that's what life is all about. Life is about being a nature nut, a true nature nut. I'm a true nature nut, and I hope you are too. We'll see you again soon. Hope you enjoyed the world of true bugs. Boy, you should have seen the leaf-footed bug I once encountered in Trinidad. Unbelievable, big leafy feet, incredible. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. <laughs>